I can't see it. You can. What's going on, everybody? Brandon Scoopy Robinson, senior writer at Heavy.com and the host of the Scoop B Radio podcast. But today we're here because of Heavy Live with Scoop B. And it's always a pleasure when you got Hall of Famers in the building, no different here. We got my main man, Isaiah Thomas. Uncle Zeke, what's going on, sir? I'm good, brother. How you doing? It's always good to talk to you. Always good to talk to you, too, man. Staying busy, staying socially distant, and... um. It's 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 a crazy time of the year because you got the election, you got the end of the finals, you got football still going on. How are you doing post finals? You, you know what? It, it, like you said, so much going on. Um, you know, you got the election, you got the World Series, you got football, basketball just ended. You know, it's like every sport started at the same time with the election and COVID. So it, it's just. Um, you know, every day you just uh, waking up and saying, okay, what's on the agenda today? And let me get through it. You know, it's funny because um, I was looking at highlights over the weekend and uh, your Hoosiers in football <laughs> are now nationally ranked. They're number 17. They beat yeah. Penn State. Did you watch the game? I, I watched the game and, um, you know, I was flicking back and forth, uh, but I, I watched the game and I was. I was so happy when, when Penn State scored because I was like, okay, now we got a chance, you know. <laughs> and uh, you never know because normally Penn State, Ohio State, Michigan, those are the class of the, of the, of the Big Ten when you talk about football. But sure. seeing Indiana back up there, uh, you know, we, we haven't been there since like the Lee Corso days. <laughs> that's a, In other words, that's a long, long time. Been a long time. So you, we talked about um, just that juxtaposition between you know basketball, football, World Series, and Election Day. And um, what I noticed about the NBA bubble uh, was that there were a lot of players who registered to vote um, in the bubble. I, I'm curious, number one, I'm finding it interesting that there were so many players uh, in the NBA uh, on record that were not registered to vote are voting for the first time. From your vantage point, when you played, uh, was politics something that was discussed in your era, and were there a lot of people in the same vein that were not registered? Uh, yeah, politics was definitely discussed, uh, particularly on, on our team a lot. And um, I don't, I don't remember, um, you know, people not being registered as as much, um, you know, in the NBA uh, as as we found uh, during this period of time. Uh, and you and you have to remember that the NBA was coming out of the the, the 60s, the 70s, mm -hmm. you know, and, the, and the 80s. So everyone was was very politically uh, conscious, active, uh, and you know it seemed to be like a a, a lull uh, in sport from uh, the 90s to 2000. Uh, and basically, when LeBron came back, in, when LeBron came into the league, and you know he started speaking on on activism. Uh, again, that's when everything kind of picked up. But I would say, like in in the '90s, uh, you know, there there wasn't a lot of uh, you know the champions didn't speak out as much. Uh, the best players in the league wasn't speaking out on on social issues as much as we were in the '80s and in the '70s. Chris Paul spearheaded um, that whole process with voting. Um, when I look at Chris Paul, I see you so much. Um, do you see? Well, it, it's, it's a compliment uh, anytime that you're, you're compared to or or uh, see someone uh, like him having so much success. <clears throat> and then people would, you know, invoke your name along with his. So, you know, Chris has been not only phenomenal as a player, but he's been phenomenal as a leader. And he's done all the right things. So, you, you, know, uh, you know, talking to his dad, he's been a good son. He's a good father. So, you know, everything is... Uh, Everything is good with him, and anytime uh, my name is mentioned next to his, it is uh, quite the compliment. What do you make of his season this year? Because people thought he was washed like LeBron was washed. You know, I, I thought this was a, a very interesting uh, year, not for a statistical play, but I thought that the leaders in the sport really showed uh, that the – that the leadership side of the game is just as valuable as uh, the statistical side of the game. And when you look at leadership uh, in terms of what Paul did, um, what Butler did, uh, 
what LeBron James did. I mean, those three things really stand out because during COVID, uh, there was a stoppage in play. Then there was another work stoppage in the bubble. Uh, so from a leadership standpoint, they had to keep galvanizing their team, keep them in shape, keep them focused. And I thought they did that beautifully. My late grandmother would say this. I'm, I'm going to bring it to the show. Learn me something. Teach me something. <laughs> would you like to see him in a Knicks uniform? You know, I I, I, I think anywhere that, that Chris goes, um, you know, he'll he'll be successful from a, from a leadership standpoint. I think, uh, you know, anytime that, the expectations are are so high in a, in a different place, um, you know, and him not being as young as he were, uh, you know, you know, several years ago. Uh, I worry about if the expectations will be too much uh, for his name uh, at this point in time, uh, because the Knicks fan base is is starving for uh, success. They want success, and uh, I like Chris a lot. Uh, have great respect for him. Uh, I wish, and I think I'll, I think he probably wishes that they would have got twenty-three-year-old Chris uh, mm. in the garden because that that's a different story. LeBron James, you tweeted recently that he's your goat. It makes me think of uh, the uh, Wakanda Forever movie, uh, Black Panther. They say, "Is that your king? Is yeah. that your king?" You tweeted LeBron James being your goat. Why? But to me, I, I think when you talk about the GOAT, particularly when you talk about the GOAT for the black community, right? Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the champion has always spoke for the voiceless. And he's always had the responsibility of speaking for the voiceless. Now in the white community, that may be different. Uh, you know, Tom Brady doesn't have to speak for, and Joe Montana doesn't, doesn't have to speak for uh, the, the white community and uplift them in America. Mm -hmm. Black community, it's always been different, whether it be Joe Lewis when he was fighting uh, Max Schmeling, how important that fight was, you know, uh, Jesse Owens won, uh, winning the gold medal in, in Germany, how important that was, uh, Tommy Smith. Uh, so when you look at Muhammad Ali, Muhammad Ali wasn't the greatest because he knocked people out. Muhammad Ali was the greatest boxer because of what he did outside of the playing field, outside of the ring. So the champion has always carried that mantle, particularly mm -hmm. in the NBA. Bill Russell carried it, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar carried it, Dr. J carried it, I carried it, and now LeBron is doing it. So when you look at what the GOAT means for us in terms of lifting us up in this society, speaking for the voiceless in our community, you can be a champion on the floor and you can be a champion off the floor. So what he's done statistically uh, the numbers don't lie, but also what he's done outside of the of the playing field, that doesn't lie either. So, you know, in terms of uh, a complete basketball player, in terms of passing, dribbling, uh, shooting, rebounding, uh, no one has done what he's done uh, statistically in every single category. Now, we've had players to dominate one category, but we've never had a player that's come in and and dominated in so many statistical categories across the board, and that's LeBron James. Let it be known, as you would say, sure. <laughs> men, men lie, women lie, numbers don't, as Jay-Z would say. Um, give my phone in the background now. Listen, man, this is the day of uh, people in the office. As, as long as you're not, like, changing the baby or getting up and, you know, you just got basketball shows or whatever, as long as... No, no, we good, we good, we good. <laughs> I got real clothes on. <laughs> no, I got basketball shorts on, I can't lie to you. But I'm curious to know, you um, talked about the GOAT, and a lot of people have this conversation about Michael Jordan, LeBron James, um, and all and many of you guys, all these different people, Kobe Bryant, that are the GOAT. Two-part question. Is it possible to have more than one GOAT and do you think that people go overboard with that GOAT conversation? No, I, I think it's good in all sport. You know, it, it seems like basketball is the only sport that's really capped at one person. Sure. I mean, in football, you know, you've had different GOATs, you know. I mean, hey, Tom Brady passed Joe Montana, and it was, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, in baseball, you know, Barry Bonds was talking about passing, you know, Hank Aaron, you know. There was some controversy around, you know, just the the, the – the, 
the substance use, but everything else, it was like, okay, in hockey, you know, uh, Mario Lemieux, you know, this passing Gretzky. I mean, so the only sport that really where you kind of capped at where you can't, you can't be better than <laughs> is, is, is in the NBA. And I look at Kareem, though, when you look at Kareem, for me, I, I've said this, and I'm on record saying it, uh, Kareem is the best, you know, basketball player in terms of GOAT status. When you talk about what he's done off the floor, what he's talk about, what you talk about, what he's done un- inside the playing arena, uh, from high school to college to, to the NBA. I mean, no one compares to his stats, to, to his winning, to his two plus decades of domination in the sport. And actually, if you want to go all the way back to college, you would say three decades of domination in the sport. No one has done it better than Kareem. And when you look at what LeBron has done these last 17 years mm-hmm. in NBA, I mean, that's, that, that's, you know, maybe maybe six years from now, people will look back and won't be as emotional about it. But when you look at what he's done, and I think the players that he's playing against, you know, it's, it's funny when you hear them uh, talk because, uh, you know, they don't they want they don't want to say he's the greatest because they got to play against him and compete against him. Right. They realize that they are playing against something that's different. <laughs> that's real, and I think when you bring up the Kareem argument and even Bill, throwing Bill Russell in there, I think that the prerequisite for goat has to be clear cut. That's like. You know, some people think J Lo is, is the is the prettiest thing, prettiest prettiest actress or or entertainer. Or some people say Halle Berry. Some people like what is the prerequisite? And so when that's what you're gonna say something. No, I was gonna say you know we, you know we we we've had a criteria of measurement, uh, you know, in terms of you know what the what the what the goat was and 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 what again in all community what he had to do not only on the floor in terms of a champion but also off the floor so you know when you look at what kareem lebron russell joe lewis all these all these people that i'm naming right they have impacted not only sport but they've impacted society from a stance of uplifting all race and have spoke to 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 racial issues have spoke to education have spoke to everything that 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 was burdensome us burdensome in our society on the political side so there was a political activism that always came with being the goat you couldn't you know if muhammad ali wasn't wasn't speaking for us mm-hmm. and lifting us in the community would we be saying he's the greatest i, I don't know that's valid i, I don't know that's you know? All. i got a question Okay, so we watched The Last Dance. We yes. saw Michael, we saw your point of view. I got it in your mind, you're a business person, so I think this makes perfect sense. So you and, and Magic made peace on NBA TV. Shaq did too. If a company had an infinite amount of money to spend for an hour of uninterrupted dialogue between you and Michael Jordan, here's my question. Number one, how much would the check have to be? Number two, what would you and Mike actually talk about in that hour? You know that you, I don't. I don't need a check. You know that that's not what I'm about. Sure. Uh, uh, so you you wouldn't have to pay me anything. And I and I honestly, until the last dance, I never knew there was a beef. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> I knew, sure. you know, again, I, I you know I had gone out to dinner with him. I had seen him socially. Uh, had communi- I, I never knew that he felt that way about me. Uh, so, um, you know, I again, I, I, I have no hard feelings against against anyone. And when I talk about, you know, the greatest players, I'm only talking about it from my perspective. No sure. slight to anyone, but it's just an acknowledgement of how great LeBron James is and what I've been watching. And sure. it's also an acknowledgement to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Now, if people think that I'm trying to slight somebody by talking about these two, then then they have an agenda of their own, sure. not necessarily mine. Um, so, but anyway, what would we talk about? I don't know, but I, 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 I hey, look, 
I'm not afraid of anybody. And I'll sit down and, and speak with anybody and, and anybody who's ever been around me, seen me, been close to me. I'm not one who walk around with fear and I'm not one who walk around with hate. Uh, so, you know, like I said, I, I, I never knew he felt that way until I watched The Last Dance. What is something like for me? I felt like I live, we live my childhood with the last dance. Like people that you know, the usual suspects, like the Nick Andersons, the you, uh, the Penny Hardaways, the Horace Grants. What is something that you, being an NBA lifer, um, I consider you the mayor of the NBA. What is something from that last dance documentary that you yourself did not know, besides what we just talked about? You know, I, I didn't know that there was so much turmoil within their team. Uh, you know, in, in terms of, you know, with his teammates, uh, with Jerry Krause, in terms of the peak behind the curtain, uh, I didn't realize that it was that, you know, you know, chaotic, so to speak. Um, and, you know, I, I, again, I come from the era where the Lakers was tight, the Celtics were tight, the 76ers were tight. You know, we as a Piston team, you know, we, we still got group chats. We still type, you know. Um, I, I And when I watch The Last Dance, it just seems like uh, them as a team, even though they won a lot, didn't seem to be as as tight and as close as 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 we were, as, you know, other teams were. And I, I found that fascinating, but I also found it uh, – unique that they could overcome all of that and still win. How did you feel when Chuck Daly left the Pistons and joined the New Jersey Nets as their head coach? Um, you know, my, again, my, my career was, was over. Chuck left at the right time. <laughs> uh, he knew the wrist surgery that I had, you know, we, we kept it pretty close. Um, basically in, in 91, uh, early in that year, I had career ending wrist surgery. Mm -hmm. um, and I never was supposed to play basketball again with the risk that I had, particularly being a, a point guard. So I think Chuck saw the writing on the wall. Uh, we were a team that was on a decline. And, uh, you know, he when, when he went to New Jersey, we were we were happy for him. But at the same time, we knew we knew our end was there. The Nets have Steve Nash as their head coach. They got Kyrie Irving. They got Kevin Durant. They've got DeAndre Jordan. Jared Allen, Karis LeVert, um, and a myriad of other people. I've told you this uh, during COVID, we talked, and, and I told you that I see a similarity between your Pistons team and the Brooklyn Nets. Publicly, do you see it? You know, I, I can see the similarities, uh, you know, but we didn't we, we didn't have a Kevin Durant. <laughs> it's true. Let, let's be clear. I mean, that that's a, that's a whole nother level in terms of basketball play. Um, but in, in terms of uh, the, the versatility that they were able to bring to the floor, you know, uh, from, the, from the three guards with myself, Joe, Benny, when you look at, you know, LeVert, when you look at Dinwiddie, you look at uh, uh, Durant, and you also, you know, look at Kyrie, who I think is uh, probably uh, the most creative, creative player in the game, who really, um, you know, is about exploiting the art and the artistry of the game, sure. uh, I, I relate to that. You know, uh, I, I admire that. And then when you when you pair him with you know another a creative mind like a Steve Nash, uh, I, I just think that you know the, the Nets are not only are going to be exciting, but they have the potential to be just beautiful watching him play every single night. That's real. And when I look at Steve Nash uh, as the head coach. It seems like there's a United Nations there. You got Steve Nash as the as the, the general, the president of the Nets. You got Amari Stoudemire, somebody he played with as an assistant coach. Um, what do you like about Nash in Brooklyn? You know, I, I like that they have a, they have a basketball culture, and they have basketball minds. Uh, so what what they have is um, uh, participants in the sport who have excelled in the sport. And what the Nets have done is basically rewarded uh, the, the workers, so to speak, and, and not only rewarded the workers by excelling and moving them to coaching positions, to general managers' positions, and now 
uh, the players have a voice within their team. So you, you really have, you know, the, you know, from an education standpoint, they say that the, the, the best way to, to have uh, pure education is through uh, uh, participation in observation, and therefore you have total immersion. When you look at the Brooklyn Nets from a basketball standpoint, they have total immersion uh, within a basketball culture and organization. Now, can they bring all that education out and put it out on the floor and apply it? You, uh, people forget you coached as well. Um, and most notably, you coached the Pacers uh, in the NBA Finals, they played the Lakers. First question, um, is it easier to command the attention of players as the head coach when you play, or does it not matter that some head coaches never play basketball? No, I, I don't think it matters. Uh, uh, but there's a there's a there's a certain thing that, uh, from a playing standpoint, in participating, uh, an experience and a, an emotion that you would have that someone who's never done it can never feel or understand. That doesn't mean that they can't coach it. Sure. It mean that they can't feel it or understand. So that 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 fear or that that success, that overcoming that moment, that doubt, if that if that person who you're talking to can't relate to that, have never felt that, then he can't communicate and help guide you over that hump. So therefore a lot of players get over that hump on their own when they're playing for a coach who's never experienced what they've experienced. Uh, so uh, I look at, you know, the when you walk into that locker room and, and you have 12 to 15 uh, millionaires sitting in front of you. Mm -hmm. That 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 voice, that intimidation, that command for respect, because those PhDs who are sitting in front of you, they know exactly, they know exactly in 30 seconds if you are educated and you know what you're talking about or you don't. And you will lose the locker room in 30 seconds if you if you ain't got if you don't know your stuff because they are all PhDs and so this this is when you know like when whenever you see a team and there's a huddle and then there's a huddle after the huddle sure <laughs> the, yeah. huddle, the huddle after the huddle is the is the PhD saying okay I heard I know what we heard over there but check this out just in case we got to have a plan B. Let's put plan B together. My uncle Kev, for years, he, he was a high school uh, graduate and drove buses from New Jersey Transit for years. And he always told me, you know, Brandon, I know you got a master's degree. He goes, but I got a PhD in common sense. Yeah. <laughs> and so when you talk about that, people forget or people have to be reminded that, you know, that being a basketball expert is, is there's a level of you know you, you you spend 12 years you got your phd you spend eight years you got your master's degree uh, yeah there's a there's a level of um you know what uh how can i say it um, they always say experience is the best teacher sure and, and why it is the best teacher is because it connects emotionally and physically mm -hmm. you know, so the observer can observe critique and right, but the participant can feel. And when you can feel it, it's totally different than observing. Now, when you can observe it, feel it, apply it, and then give it to someone else. You know, like you talk about my, my Indiana days, uh, that, that those three years I had in Indiana, those were, those were great coaching moments for me. Um, and I, I thought that, you know, we, we had a team in Indiana. And, I, and I'll be as bold as to say this. I think if I, if, if, if Bird wouldn't have fired me, I believe I would have won a championship with that Pacer team that following year. Uh, I think we would have beat the Pistons. I think, you know, and I know I'm a, I know I'm a Piston, but I think we would have beat the Pistons. And I think we'd have went back to the finals with, with O'Neal and, you know, that, that group of, of Harrington, Artest, and, uh, Reggie Miller, uh, I think we. I think that was that was my team in my time to go. 
you, you mentioned uh, that Pacers team, and you talked about just being an observer. As a Hall of Famer in the NBA during your playing career and being a coach, coaching against Shaq and Kobe Bryant probably was very difficult for you to observe. Yeah. True or false? Um, well, I did coach against them, and um, I I think I was one and one. Um, yeah, I was one and one against them. Uh, actually, we beat them in LA. Okay. And I remember uh, the, the last play of the game, having, and this is where it comes down to, you know, having having played against Phil Jackson as a player when he was coaching. Mm -hmm. right? And now he's diagramming a play at the end of the game. And now I'm coaching against him and I'm saying to myself, I know he's thinking that I'm going to think that he's going to Kobe and Shaq, but from playing against him, I know that out of bounds play, he's going to draw it up for Lamar Odom. And he's not going to draw it up for Shaq or Kobe because that's what he did for Pippen when he beat us a couple of times as a player. So knowing the coaching tendencies, knowing the player tendencies, you know, and, and playing against Shaq and Kobe, they were just a nightmare. They were just, they were just, they were too good, uh, you know, for the league. And, you know, they were the dominant center and also the dominant perimeter player at that time. What's special about Jason Kidd as a coach? Uh, what's special about him is, again, right, when we talk about observation and participation, Jason Kidd's uh, gift from a participatory standpoint in terms of him understanding offenses and defenses because he's had to dissect it, play against it, and then was successful in, in understanding what he was seeing. So there isn't a defense that has been invented that Jason Kidd hasn't played against and beat. Uh, so he will know where the weak spots are in every defense that he faces, that he coaches against. And he can tell his players, this is what you look for. This is where the openings are going to be. Is a point guard still a team leader today in NBA basketball? Um, I, I believe I believe so, but uh, at, at the end of the day, um, just because you have the title of point guard doesn't necessarily mean that you are going to be the leader of the team. Uh, leadership comes in a, in, a, uh, in a lot of different ways, in a variety of ways. Um, there, are, there are forceful leaders, there are verbal leaders, there are nonverbal leaders, there are leaders who lead by example. And it all depends on what type of team you have um, so just because a guy is designated the point guard doesn't mean that he may be the leader of the team. And you've been around long enough, you know, there are leaders on the team who may be the ninth, 10th, 11th man, uh, and he may not play at all. Sure. He's the leader of the team. So leadership skills in leading a team has nothing to do with how many points you score. Mm -hmm. Who's an ideal point guard today? But you got to say Paul Curry, uh, Kyrie Irving, LeBron James, James Harden. Uh, you know th those guys are you know they're they're in a class and an elite level by themselves. A because they can score the ball, uh, but B they show up every night, and and C they can you know there's a there's a demand from the audience of uh, these guys I just named that you have to you have to do more than just play basketball. You got to give me a show too. Like like the show that Steph Curry puts on before every game where he'll just go out and shoot. And the way he goes through his shooting routine and fans show up for his shooting routine. And he never disappoints. He comes out on the road, he gives you the show, he gives you the show at home. He's playing. I mean I I, I just I truly admire what these young guys have done in the NBA and how they're going about doing it and the creativity that they're that they're showing. Chauncey Billups and you both have in common. You guys were both championship point guards for the Pistons in different eras. Um, Chauncey is now an assistant coach uh, with the Los Angeles Clippers. Long overdue or right on time? I think it's I think it's long overdue. Uh, but just because it's long overdue, 
uh, doesn't mean that um, he hasn't been studying. So what Chauncey has had the benefit of, because it's long overdue, he's had more classroom work. <laughs> you know, he's had more time to study and, and hone his craft to get it right uh, and to make sure that he's able to to give the right information to the players when they need it. Rajon Rondo is going to be a bomb head coach whenever he retires. He broke some of your records, um, but I mean, honestly, the longer you play, the more that opportunity is going to come someone's way. What makes Rajon Rondo special in your mind? You know, I've always called uh, Rondo a, a genius. Um, and, you know, you, you know, again, all game has been compartmentalized to just these four or five statistical boxes that uh, we don't see the the knowledge and the PhD that's walking through the door. So we only evaluate and judge players from the neck down, <clears throat> particularly African-American players uh, throughout the history of our game. Mm -hmm. But Rondo, uh, from day one, you recognize his genius as an IQ and his IQ in terms of basketball intellect. Rondo is not going to go to the Hall of Fame because, you know, he was a great shooter or a great pass or anything like that. Rondo's going to the Hall of Fame because he was probably one of the smartest players to play, and he's a champion. And so, believe it or not, I put Rondo and Mark Jackson in the same category in terms of basketball IQ and genius level because you look at both of these two guards, both of them maximize not only their talent, but they maximize their brain capacity for the game. Neither one of them, both of them came into the league with severe deficiencies of what they could do. But what they could do most times out on the floor was outthink their opponent, mm -hmm. their opponent in difficult positions. So that opponent couldn't capitalize on their deficiencies, but they can capitalize on the opponent's and when you look at Rondo and you look at Mark Jackson, from an IQ and intellect standpoint, I don't think there has been two point guards in the game of basketball that has gotten more out of their talent and their limited capabilities than these two have. Derrick Rose, Chicago native, just like yourself. He plays for the Pistons, just like you did. Are you pleased with it? What do you like about his game in Detroit? I, I, I hate that he got hurt. Uh, first of all, because, you know, coming, coming, coming out of Chicago and then playing for the Chicago Bulls and being the youngest MVP and having the type of success that he, uh, that he was having, uh, and then the humility and the humbleness that he always carried himself with, you know, that, that's, that's Chicago. That's like, okay. And, and when he got hurt and he was bouncing around the league, I was so happy that he got to Detroit. He came to Detroit because now I could not only bond with him, but I knew we had a fan base that would accept Derrick Rose as a person and appreciate, keyword, appreciate the type of player that they were getting in the latter stages of his basketball career. And I think because the Pistons fans appreciate Derrick Rose, I think it even elevated his game a little higher. Sure. Him feel a little better about himself and gave him a little bit more belief. And that's that's the Detroit love community mm -hmm. from a basketball standpoint, man. When they get behind you and push you, they look at me a little guy, you know, I, I won back to back championships because of that Detroit love, that Detroit connection. And they get behind you and go, Hey, they they elevate you and they lift you and they hold you up and then they fight for you. <laughs> was it was it when you played for the Pistons, you being from Chicago, playing in Detroit, was that like that's like to me, somebody being from New York and playing for the Wizards, like Detroit, like Washington, DC and New York, they have like this rivalry, you know, whether it's Giants, right or now it's Washington football team. You know, you look at Chicago as Bears, Lions. Was that an adjustment for you being in Detroit, being from Chicago? Yeah, it was an it was an adjustment because you know every time I went back home, you know I got my family and my friends in all the neighborhood on the west side of Chicago. 
you know, they like Junior, we love you, but you know, we want the Bulls to win, <laughs> you know? So <clears throat> giving your people tickets and then seeing them cheer for the other team in the stands, of course that was adjustment, but you know, my job was to, you know, always break their heart and to, you know, make sure that my team won and their team lost. What was that like uh, coming home? Tickets, visits, you're in a hotel trying to prepare. I, I would, you came to Chicago two times a year. What was that like when you were a Piston? You know, it, it wasn't, um, you know, you say I'm, I'm in a hotel trying to prepare. Most of the time I was at my mom's house uh, sleeping on the floor. You know, <laughs> I would go back home and, you know, spend time with my brothers and sisters and, you know, talk all night and just, you know, you know, get love from the family. And, um, you know, it was always good coming back home because Chicago, you know, there, there's the Chicago that, 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 you know, uh, from, from being a fan and that's the, the stadium in the downtown area. Sure. Well, I wasn't from the downtown area. You know, I, I would, I was a kid trying to shine shoes downtown and they would kick me out of downtown. So I'm, I'm from the west side of Chicago. So my neighborhood, my Chicago, you know, that, that, that's what I knew. I didn't know downtown. The first time I went to Rush Street was, was when I was in the NBA, <laughs> you know, coming back home. So, you know, that, that part of Chicago that people talk about. And, and so when they talk about Chicago, most people are talking about downtown, the newspaper and all that. When I talk about Chicago, I'm talking about the west side of Chicago, mm -hmm. period. That, that's, that's the Chicago I knew. That's the Chicago I'm from. And that's the Chicago that I'm sure none of these people ain't never been to. <laughs> you know I know. I know that you know. <laughs> Zach Levine and the Bulls, they got Billy Donovan. What do you make of the hire and just where the Bulls can be next season? I think it's a good hire. Uh, and the reason why I think it's a good hire is because Chicago is a young team. And not only are they a young team, um, they're, they're a young team that Billy will be familiar with their talent because he scouted all of them when they were in high school. Um, so he knows exactly what he's walking into, uh, the type of players that he's getting ready to coach. Uh, so I, I think Chicago has is, is, is got a chance with Billy and, and then Mo Cheeks coming back home. I think that's going to be a, a great situation for the Chicago Bulls. Yeah, that's a great look when you talk about that. Ben Wallace, is he a Hall of Famer? Absolutely. Every Pistons a Hall of Fame. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, if, 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 if real is real, right? Mm -hmm. you, look at, you look at what the Pistons championship teams have done, who we are, you know, and, and the sacrifices that we made uh, to, to be the best team. If you're talking about rewarding teams, and you're talking about rewarding the individuals for being champions, mm -hmm. then then you're talking about Ben Wallace, Bill Lambeer, both of them are Hall of Fame. Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, and the Celtics, they didn't get past the heat. What are they missing moving forward? Um, you know, you 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 want to say experience, but they, they have that now. Uh, so they they need a little bit more luck. And they need a, a little bit more hunger uh, because they, uh, they they have the talent, uh, they have the experience now. Now can they overcome those obstacles that will be placed in their way along the way? Victor Oladipo is ending with a guy like you, plays for the Pacers. Um, he's in an interesting situation, you know, as far as his future. But um, what do you make of him next season with the Pacers? I think, I think Oladipo is going to have a great year, uh, you know, when, when he's healthy. And I, I was worried about him when he came back uh, this year because I didn't think that he was fully healthy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, as a as an elder in the league, you know, I even, I even called him and I texted him and just said, you know, I, I know you're anxious, uh, but make sure, like, you are really healthy because you got a, you got a, a great career ahead of you. And... Um, you know, I, I hope during this period of time uh, he's fully healed because when he's fully healed and healthy, one of the uh, 
uh, you know, the best backcourt uh, players in the game. Charlene Champagne is everywhere. I understand that the Pistons, as well as the uh, Phoenix Suns, uh, are are the face, the NBA team faces of Charlene Champagne. Pop Champagne like we won a championship, as Puffy and Mace would say. How yeah. cool is this process with you and Charlene? It's, it's been great. It's Not only has it been great, but just, you know, and you know when we started, uh, just seeing uh, the grind and the hustle that we've had to, 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 to take on over the last four years. And then actually seeing it catch on, to see people drinking it, to see people enjoying it, to see it at weddings, to see it at graduations, uh, you know, NBA team celebrating championship moments with it in the locker room, uh, family dream. I mean, it, I mean, for me just to sit there and watch it and be like, man, this is, this, this is all right. And, and not only is it all right, it's like they're, yeah, people are, 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 are doing it to, to help me out. Right. Mm -hmm. But also they're doing it because they actually like the quality of the champagne. And if they didn't like the quality of the champagne, then they wouldn't be drinking it and they wouldn't be talking about it so much. So, you know, right now we're one of the fastest growing champagnes in the United States. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm really proud of that. It's pretty cool when you talk about um, the champagne thing. And the thing that I think of most, you, you know, you're an NBA lifer. I remember I was young, but watching a ton of, you know, uh, old classic, you know, games and, the champagne bash for you and you talking about heaven must be like this. Hey, heaven, <laughs> heaven. What is it like? Like when you win a championship, like what, like, what do you think? Are you thinking of the season? Are you thinking of your family? Like what goes through your mind when the champagne is pouring and, and you're holding the trophy? Man, it, it ain't nothing. It, it's like, okay, you, when you at the top of your sport, and you, and you know that there's nobody, no other team, no other person hmm. that can beat you. And you beat them all, and you get to stand on top of the mountain and say, I beat you, I beat you, I beat you, I beat you. <laughs> and, and all they can do is do this. Yeah. <laughs> you know, from a competitive standpoint, I mean that that there's nothing like it, you know. I, you know I, you know when Mike Tyson was fighting, you know I I, I got to know him, uh, you know pretty well, mm -hmm. and you know his 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 championship moments when you the, the the king of the hill and there's there's no person that can beat you. That is that is such an intoxicating feeling that uh, you know I, you you know you. You, you wish everybody could experience it, but the champion who does, that's what makes LeBron James and, and, and Jordan and Kareem and Magic, myself, Bird, once you get that feeling, you don't want anybody else to have it. So mm. you train harder, you work harder, because you don't want to lose that feeling. Is Larry, is he cold when you touch him or is he warm? Does he ever get warm? Is he always cold when you hold him? Larry O'Brien, the trophy. You know what? Whenever I grabbed him, he, he was full of champagne. And he said, <laughs> <laughs> That's real. Brother, here's the good news. You off the hot seat. Oh, I didn't know this was a hot seat. My fault. I thought we were just talking. Uh, there you go. Every time, listen, it's a, it's, a, it's a celebration every time that we meet up, as um, Nicki Minaj would say. But um, no, man, it's, it's always good to talk to you, your insight. Underrated, one of the most underrated basketball minds uh, in basketball. When I think of basketball minds, me personally, I put you, Magic, LeBron, and I'm still figuring out my fourth up there. But you, you, you're definitely up there. I think on every level, um, you, you've 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 been successful, and um, you just find new ways to be innovative. And I think that's the key of being a student of your craft. Well, thank you. And I I fashion myself as a forever learner. You, you never know it all, and every day I try to learn something new, and uh, just just walk through the walk through the world with, with with fresh eyes and open ears. That's it, brother. Thank you. Thank you. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Thanks.